The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies, but also by the generous donations of you, the listener. Special thanks goes to Dean Clark, Alex McIntosh, James Richards, Tobias Whiting, Marcus Wheeler, Keith Erickson, Glenn Oberhauser, Robert Ruffner, and David Chakowsin. Guys, thank you so much for your generous support. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast, episode 178. A hobby news special with hosts Neil Shook, Mike Hobbs and Mike Whittaker, and special guest Henry Hyde. This show was recorded on the 14th of September 2016. Welcome to another episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. I'm your host, Neil Shuck. Today's episode is slightly different in the fact that it contains just a single interview. Originally, this was going to be a part of a larger show and was actually going to take up most of the news segment. However, uh, as we got into editing of the podcast, it became quickly apparent that if we were to put all this together in with all the material we already recorded, that show would be massively in excess of four hours. And given the content of this interview, uh, I didn't want to cut this interview, edit this interview down at all. So, at least to me, it seemed self-evident that actually the best thing I could do was to release this part of the show actually as a completely separate podcast. And so this is what we find. So as I said, this show takes the form of an interview that we recorded last week with Henry Hyde. Now this follows on from the fact that just before we, we recorded the interview, Henry had uh, finished his last piece of work on Miniature War Games Battle Games magazine, uh, issue 402, and that was going to be the last magazine he was producing for Warners. Obviously, I've come to know Henry over a number of years, and I'm pleased to call him a friend. So, I basically turned around and asked him uh, whether he'd be willing to um, have an interview with us and essentially give his side of the story of what's been going on with the magazine uh, and the reasons behind why he resigned as an editor, because I think this is something that some people out there will be interested in. And Henry very kindly agreed. So this is what we have for you in this particular show. And so with no further ado, we'll take a quick break and when we come back we'll be talking with Henry Hyde, now the ex editor of Miniature War Games with Battle Games magazine. I don't like it, Sergeant. Me neither, sir. Good Lord, it's really looking pretty bad. Yes, sir. It happens every time, sir. It's too predictable, sir. How far do you think we've uh, we've advanced, Sergeant? Six inches, sir. It's always six inches. We advance six inches, then Jerry gets a go. The lads are... uh, I'm calling it Hygo Hugo, sir. Hygo Hugo? Grief. And they don't like it, sir. Oh. No. Oh, not like it. Ah, uh, well, uh, Seems pretty straightforward to me. Rather like cricket. We have an innings, then, uh, the other chap does. Well, that's all very well, sir. Cricket, sir. But, begging your pardon, 
You don't like that, sir, in war. I don't think Mr. Hitler plays like that. What, Hitler? No, gosh, he like to go all the time. Oh, no, sir, lovey. Oh. Well, well, sir, anyway, sir, it's like this, sir. If it carries on like this, I go, you go. Me and the lads won't be coming to your Thursday evening games club. And that's the way it is, sir. Looking for more of a challenge with your World War II games? Are you tired of the predictability of I go, you go systems? Iron Bean Shop Mum provides real command challenges on an unpredictable battlefield. Two fat lardies, playing the period and not the rules since 2002. Pip pip. Have you ever wondered what's going on in Wargaming? We do too. So come with us as we go behind the hobby with the Meeples and Miniatures interview. the big things on the hobby news in the last couple of weeks is not so much about people who make stuff in the hobby as people who kind of write about stuff in the hobby. Unless you've been hiding somewhere and haven't really noticed, there's been uh, there's been a few happenings with uh, Miniature War Games, Battle Games magazine. Now, since all of the presenters on the show uh, have been involved with the magazine in one way or another, we've yeah we've been getting some ideas about what's been going on and we thought we could give you our ideas and some of the things that we know about about what's going on on with the magazine but actually we thought what better than to ask the man himself so I'd like to welcome to the meeples and miniatures podcast for a change as opposed to view from the veranda henry hyde hello henry hello there neil how nice to be in slightly different surroundings Indeed, welcome to... virtually different. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're virtually they're like... very different, that's for sure. <laughs> just, yeah, a, just a second. Dearest, don't wait up, we've got Henry on the podcast. Yes. Now, have you got a gin? Uh, actually, no, I've got myself a nice big pint mug of tea. That's good, because there's no alcohol on this podcast. But whatever <laughs> you've I, I have, a, I have you know. likewise a mug of tea and a slice of cake. Oh, slice of cake. There you go. <sighs> Can't have that. Anyway, yes. Hello, okay. guys. Nice to be with you. Indeed. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I mean, and it's nice to be with you. And see, at the point where we can actually talk, because normally it's very difficult to get a hold of you because you're so busy kind of editing a magazine. And Yeah, well, it's going to be even more difficult to get hold of me now that I'm not editing a magazine. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Well, that is perhaps both good and bad news. Uh, but anyway, sh- shall we jet back uh, a couple of weeks? And and so, huge breaking news in the fact that, well, not breaking news now, broken news, that uh, you're no longer ready to move Miniature War Games. That's correct. And actually, as we as we learned today, uh, it, it is now going to be Miniature War Games and not, no longer Miniature War Games, but Battle Games. That's correct. Mm. Um yeah, I suspected that might happen. I think because Warners never really got battle games. They they couldn't quite understand why on earth would you tag the battle games na- name sort of underneath the miniature war games name. I mean, that's just silly, isn't it? That that goes against all the rules of masthead design in newspapers and magazines. I'm sorry, but I, I, I seem to remember 2000 AD, back in the late 70s, amalgamating with all sorts of different comics, and uh, we had 2000 AD in Star-Lord, and 2000 AD in whatever for, else they bought. For most of a decade, yeah. there was International Musician and Recording World. Yes. Well, I mean, all I can say is that as someone who's been on the inside of this story, I can tell you they never got it. Okay. Yeah. Whereas the previous publishers, Atlantic publishers, did. And in fact, if it isn't, you know, if it hasn't been bleeding obvious to anyone for the last 
what has it been, three years or something since the magazines merged, mm. really the revamped miniature war games with battle games was, well, it almost was named the other way around. It was almost battle games with miniature war games mm. uh, because those were the instructions I'd had from the boss at Atlantic Publishing that effectively he he liked battle games much more than he liked miniature war games. And so when I was made the editor and asked to kind of completely revamp the design, the the instructions I received loud and clear were, Henry, make it more like battle games. We like battle games. We like what you've done with battle games. We're not particularly happy with miniature war games because the sales of miniature war games had been plummeting. And on the other hand, after they bought Battle Games from me, and finally managed to get it on the shelves of W. H. Smith. Those last few issues that went on the shelves of W. H. Smith, the sales went sky high for Battle Games. Oh wow! So when when the merger took place, Miniature War Games was definitely on the way down, and Battle Games was on the way up. So it was no surprise that the boss of Atlantic wanted, you know, the the, the result of the merger to be more like Battle Games than Miniature War Games, hmm. which obviously I was more than happy about because battle games have been my baby and i know that at the time and we talked about it at the time didn't mm. we neil the fact that there was a proportion of the miniature war games readers who weren't so happy yeah um and part of the that readership that wasn't so happy of course was the people who had been very enthusiastic about the dark horizons fantasy and sci-fi section how ironic is that, boys? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes. uh, we'll come back to that. So, quick question while we're on the subject of good old battle games. Do you still have rights to the name now? Uh, well, yes, of course, because the fact is you can't copyright a title of anything. You can You can trademark a brand or a logo or a particular way of portraying a name. So, for example, I could have trade, you know, I could have had Battle Games TM, you know, tucked up in the corner there next to that logo, which would have trademarked the way in which the Battle Games name was portrayed. But you cannot copyright a title. This is something that every author knows. Mm. So, the most you can do is you could trademark a brand. So, for example, uh, Vogue magazine can't trademark the word Vogue because obviously that's just a word in the English language. I know there's been some recent spectacular court cases <laughs> of big, co- big corporations trying to trademark various words. Um, <laughs> there, there's the running story of every junior lawyer in Digital Equipment Corporation finds the Vax vacuum cleaner brand and says, can we take it to court? And their senior lawyer says, no. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yes. you know, so there's lots of yes, as opposed to shooters and stuff. Yeah, but also any court in the land looks at a particular, you know, would look at a case like this and look at use, you know, because nine tenths of the law is in possession. And of course, what's happened now is that Warners have dropped; they're about to drop the name Battle Games from the title of the magazine. It's just going to be called Miniature War Games, and so. That's a sign that, to be honest, they found the Battle Games part of the brand confusing. They saw it as something that didn't add to the brand. They saw it as something that detracted from the brand or confused the consumer. And, of course, they've already got their other magazine, Tabletop Games. So, you know, there's all these different kind of wargaming type brands bouncing around. And I think you just confused the hell out of them. And, of course... The the battle games part of the name has had sentimental value. I think we could put it like that, not just to me, but obviously to a you know, fair chunk of the readers. Yeah. At the moment that the magazine was taken over by Warners in particular, in fact, even as far back as when Atlantic Publishers asked me to merge the two magazines, I think there were already rumblings out there on TMP. Oh, just you wait, it'll all become just miniature war games, you'll see. Well, of course, those people can say, I told you so, and have been proved right. But in fact, they were dead wrong during the tenureship, you know, of when it was at Atlantic Publishers. There was no way that Trevor Ridley, bless his heart, was ever going to let us drop the battle games from that title. Yeah. 
but I think it became clear to to me that you know, and the whole reason I've resigned is that over the past how well, six to eight months, it's become increasingly clear that the management at Warner's wanted me to sing a different song from the one I was prepared to sing. And, you know, there comes a point when any person, you know, with an ounce of self-respect looks in the mirror and thinks, how much more of this can I take? Mm. And I reached the point a few weeks ago where I realized I couldn't take any more. It was just making me miserable that I was going to end up producing um, or editing a magazine that I didn't want to edit anymore. And at that point, you know, unless you're just completely mercenary or, you know, the, the nature of the job isn't important to you, it's just a job, then, you know, I had no choice really but to send in my resignation. And I know that the, I think this is the thing, a lot of hobby magazines, I mean, we have to accept, don't we, that particularly historical wargaming is a very niche pursuit. Yeah. There, I mean, I, the number of times over the years people have asked me, oh, how many historical wargamers are there? Well, that's a really good question. Mm. And I know that our mate um, Jasper at Wargame Soldiers and Strategy is someone who's tried <laughs> tried on you know on an annual basis. He's trying to find out how many historical wargamers there In are. In fact, I, I, I asked I asked him pretty much directly during the, the last poll, and he said, well, "I don't know." Exactly. I mean, we can make a guesstimate. Uh, we can make a guesstimate of what you know, but you come back to right. Well, first of all, how do you define a historical war game? How do we? What evidence do we have of these creatures? And well, okay, well, how many copies of each of the magazines get sold? And you know, I suppose the market leader still is probably War Games Illustrated with a circulation of I don't know ten thousand, something like that, maybe a bit more. War Game Social and Strategy not far behind. Miniature War Games has always been a, a little bit behind that. So, you know. But we also know that many wargamers buy all three magazines, while some wargamers only buy one of them. Mm. And certainly the number of subscribers that any of the magazines have is way below, you know, the total sales figure. I mean, I, I think most of the magazines, and this is where I can reveal it now that I don't work there anymore, most of the magazines are would be happy to be able to declare that they've actually got a thousand paid up regular subscribers so that again is obviously just a fraction of their total total circulation in fact one of the interesting things is when our battle games my little battle games was at its peak i had something like 1400 subscribers which i can tell you, you know blows m most of the big magazines the big losses out of the water but that was partly i think because my magazine was you know, subscription was what probably the primary way of getting hold of battle games, wasn't it? Because yeah. it wasn't in high street shops. So people had to make the effort to subscribe if they wanted to see it at all. And our little niche, having anything more than, you know, let's be honest, anything more than about 500 subscribers is decent. And certainly over a thousand is good going. And anything more than that, uh, you know, in terms of regular listeners uh, or, or regular subscribers, man, that's, that's highly respectable. Um, and you know, we have to, this is the reality of our niche. Now, where, and let's go come back momentarily to this, the darker horizons thing, right? Yeah. And, and the decision by Warners, which is the one that has led to the parting of the ways, which is the decision to put a 16 page fantasy and sci-fi section in the middle of the magazine. Now, obviously, they can quite rightly say, OK, we're going to be keeping the cover price the same. So what you're getting, regardless of the subject, is 16 extra pages in the magazine that you're not having to pay any extra for. Hmm. And obviously, Someone you is. Know, <laughs> most people probably will go, oh, well, that's a bonus. However, the genesis of this decision goes back to a meeting that I had. It was after the first pass sound this year, so May, whatever that, right. whatever the date was, I don't remember. But it was sort of the day afterwards. Right? I, I, I had a meeting at Warner's head office, 
in which we were discussing, you know, ways that, you know, to, to improve the position of the magazine in the marketplace, to improve its market share, to take things forward, to do, update it a bit and blah, 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 blah. All the usual stuff that obviously from time to time any magazine, you know, has a meeting about to consider. And one of the things being discussed at that meeting was to take the magazine back up to the size it had been when it was that Battle Games and Miniature War Games were first merged. Now, I don't know if you remember. Some people haven't even noticed, I could tell you. But back when Atlantic Publishers merged the two magazines, we were at 80 pages. Mm. And that continued for a few issues. Off the top of my head, I couldn't say how many. I don't know, a half dozen. That's 80 editorial pages, yes? Yeah, well, an 80-page magazine in complete. So of that, obviously, uh, I know 12 to 15 pages is advertising and, you know, bits and bobs. But the the size of the magazine was 80 pages in the same way as the size of War Games Illustrated is about a gazillion T pages, right? <laughs> 120 or whatever it is, some enormous number. So the idea was, because it's been, it's been down at 64 or 68 pages recently. Hmm. Uh, to save money, because Warner's wanted to save money, because margins are tight. The magazine, the magazine market is extremely competitive, and obviously they, Warner's are a huge company. You know, thirty, forty million pound turnover, what it is, and they, you know, pennies make pounds to them. They are very much people who look at squeaking every single, you know, fifty p they can save. So the magazine came down to 64 pages and it went onto a different sort of paper and we had to change what we were paying contributors and so on and so forth. Anyway. Uh, at Some this of us meeting, had noticed. Yes. And, you know, that's, that's an uncomfortable thing which any editor has to take on board. So, you know, my discomfort, my discomfort of, about the position of the magazine and my role in it, you know, there's, a, there's history now, you know. Uh, but let's not turn over too many old coals. Uh, but back in this meeting in May, this, this, this was discussed about being able to take the magazine back up to 80 pages. And obviously, wow, that's good news to me, music to my ears on a number of fronts. First of all, obviously, that's great for the readers, you know, particularly if we can keep the cover price the same. And she, they were saying, oh, yes, because we think we can change the way we print it because I don't know how much you know about the print trade, but magazines tend to be printed in 16 page sections. So there was a way they discovered, uh, that, you know, combination of pagination and the paper it was printed on, so on and so forth, that meant that effectively they could print more pages for the same money. Simple as that. So great. And, and, uh, and in the discussion, I was asked, Oh, you know, so if we were able to do this, Henry, probably towards the end of the year, what what do you think we should do with these extra 16 pages? And how, how, what content do you think we should offer? And I, and I said, well, obviously, I think people are fairly happy with the balance we've got at the moment. It would be nice, wouldn't it, to, you know, have perhaps half of it being more uh, historical war gaming stuff, maybe some more fantasy sci-fi, maybe a bit more for space for Brad to talk about board games. And obviously in amongst that mix is going to be more advertising pages potentially and other stuff like a club's directory and da 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 So that was kind of the conversation. And I came away from that meeting quite happy and buoyed up. Mm. Uh, that, you know, and also there'd been a discussion, let me be blunt, where I'd said, oh, you know, because obviously if the magazine increases its content by 20% or whatever, I presume there's potentially a little pay rise in there for me because obviously uh, it'll be, it's going to be extra work for me. And they'd said, oh, yes, yeah, sure, we can talk about that. So anyway, time passes. And then, um, it's probably about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago now. I, I, the time's just flown by recently. Hmm. An email received, uh, 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 pinged into my inbox at five to five of an evening. Um, <laughs> yeah, great time. And, <clears throat> and the email basically said, as of issue 403, there will be an extra 16 page section in miniature war games. It will consist entirely of fantasy and science fiction uh, and it will be put together collated by Rob Berman uh, the ex-editor of Tabletop Games who right. is now 
who is now the head of PR and marketing at Mantic Games. So I'll just mm. leave that with you for a moment. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, can I so ask a question? You can perhaps understand why that immediately triggered a number of questions in my head. The first one of which was, sorry, who's the editor of this magazine? Mm. And obviously the decision had been made without any consultation with me. Uh, it struck me as an abandonment of the 30 odd years, whatever it's been, completely independent status of Miniature World Games magazine and Battle Games. And that whilst, you know, and this is what a lot of people need to understand, because I know that there are some people when, when the Darker Horizon section disappeared from Miniature War Games, a lot of people made, you know, really quite outrageous assumptions that I just hate fantasy and science fiction. Well, you might have to beat this out, Neil, but that's complete bollocks because I am, I am personally a fantasy gamer i i don't game much sci-fi but that's you know largely because i've i've yet to find a, a fancy game system that you know floats my boat in the way that however i love and i've always loved kind of um computer sims you know uh you know big space games on the mac um yeah. that kind of stuff so you know space combat colonization games all those kind of things i love so the people who you know, made the assumption that I don't like fantasy and sci-fi, just absolutely don't know what they're talking about. And this is also sitting here talking, a man who's about to write a series of fantasy novels. So, you know, that just ain't true. I've got absolutely nothing against fantasy and science fiction. But the the, the reality is this, and this goes back to the, the problem that the Darker Horizons uh, section of the magazine had. Which is, as we've discussed before, Neil, the fantasy and science fiction, and let's put this firmly in inverted commas, community, mm -hmm. is actually extremely fragmented. Yeah. Uh, actually, compared to historical wargaming, there is no fantasy sci-fi gaming community. It tends to be brand-led. It tends to be game system led. And so you'll get someone, for example, who is a big 40k player who doesn't give an absolute monkeys at all about what the latest thing from Mantic Games is, for example. Hmm. You know, I, I'm sure you can come up with all kinds of examples of your own. And the, and so the, the proof in the pudding came when at the end of 2011, same time, funnily enough, just a touch of irony, at the same time as my battle game, bless its heart, was hitting the buffers, um, uh, Andrew Hubbock, ex-editor of Miniature War Games, had persuaded Trevor Ridley at Atlantic Publishing to produce a standalone issue of Darker Horizons. You guys might remember this. Yes. And it, you know, they printed, I don't know, six or 7,000 copies. Uh, off it went into the wild blue yonder uh, on the shelves at WH Smith's and it sold I think about 1500 copies right Which is, I take it not good well let's not when you've just, had 6000 printed no yeah. yeah let's just say I'm not sure that Trevor Ridley ever completely forgave Andrew Hubbock for it <laughs> because <laughs> uh, uh, yeah uh, let's be completely fair Andrew came straight into owning a magazine, bless him. You know, he bought it off the shelf and stepped into a world he had no experience of, which was, you know, let's say a very brave thing to do. And uh, I think to an outs because he came in with sort of an outsider's point of view, he made that assumption that, oh, well, you know, fantasy and sci-fi gaming is all, all, you know, it's all this kind of coherent thing, isn't it? And the fact of the matter is, no, it isn't. Mm. It's far from being a coherent thing, which is why, you know, brand loyalty and all that. Look what Games Workshop have, have just done. They've just relaunched White Dwarf. Yeah, after se yeah, after yeah. separating it all out you know, yeah. into all these different m magazines stuff, they just brought it back together. And, I mean, I think we were all old enough to remember Harbinger magazine. Yeah. Remember Harbinger magazine that tried to do this whole thing of okay, we'll we'll be an independent sci-fi and fantasy magazine, yeah. and lasted what eighteen months? 
Yep. Something like that. Okay. Yep. Um, let me ask this. Now, and Henry, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. So Warners have got two titles. They've got tabletop gaming and they've got miniature, uh, miniature war games. Yep. So tabletop war, war gaming, you know, is meant to be their board game tabletop, mm-hmm. not non-miniature related um, yep. magazine. Yep. Um, which covers miniature games like Drop Your Fleet Commander and Fosgrave. And they've now uh, also X-Wing. got min- an X Wing. And they've now got miniature war games, which is going to be covering science fiction and fantasy games like Fosgrave. And drops the commander in next week. Uh, next week. Funnily, funnily enough, the first, uh, the first sixteen-page special uh, uh, I happen to know is going to have a huge feature on Frostgrave in it. Oh, lovely! So, do they need two magazines, or do you think they're thinking long-term, merge, merge the two into one? Right. Let, let let me tell you what the situation is. Tabletop Games has been very successful for them. Obviously, currently called to the mm-hmm. that is that is going to go bi-monthly. Okay. Secondly, they did some market research with their readers in tabletop games. And those readers said to them, we don't want any miniatures gaming in our board game and card game magazine. So tabletop games is going to be dropping miniatures gaming. And obviously, having had that feedback, they were thinking, oh, where could we put this content? Oh, look, there's an idea. How about a big chunky centre section in Miniature War Games magazine? Mm. Like and how fun. convenient, how convenient that that should be compiled by the ex-editor of Tabletop Games, who is himself a miniatures gamer. But of course, when they got this sort of rebuff from the readers of Tabletop Games, I can imagine he must have been pretty pissed off, frankly. But uh, there's, and there's a, so, a, you know, I couldn't. I think it's reached the point where I, I have to say I couldn't possibly comment any further. That'll do. Yeah. <laughs> but on, they're, they're, they're in a bit of a weird spot here, aren't they? Because where do you draw the line? Yeah. I mean, let's look at. Oh, pick a game that somebody's very, very interested in in this podcast at the moment. Battle or Hobsey? Yes. Is That's Battle a board game. a miniature game or a tabletop game? You could say the same with commands and colours. Well, it's yeah. the same system. It's the same yes. system, yeah. Great War, yeah. All those, all those Richard Borg type things. You can say uh, about so many different games. There is, there, there's been over the last few years a blurring, I think, of the hobby. I don't think you find people who are just board gamers or miniature I mean, war gamers or historical gamers. People play games that they enjoy playing. Yeah. I mean, you can draw the line there and you can say that obviously that's a war game. It's played with miniatures. Okay, it's played on a pre-designed board, but that's obviously a miniatures a miniature war game. It goes in miniature war games. Yeah. But was... You don't have to step very far before you get something like Blood Rage, which is a board game with metric bleep tons of miniatures. Yeah. Um, is that a miniature game or a board game? I suppose, well, at, I suppose what point, think... at what point does a miniature become a token? I, yeah, I all, think all, all I can say is, do. all I can say is, guys, is from this point onwards, it is not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Never for a minute suggested it was. Yeah. I I will I will merely warn myself at imagining you sitting there watching people having problems with the problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, I think the person I my heart goes out most actually is John Treadaway. Hmm. John Treadaway, good bloke, he's a mate, and obviously he's been a columnist in the magazine for Quite some time now, isn't he, Neil? Yeah, um, yeah. And and but he has a you know a long pedigree in the hobby. He was writing for hobby magazines back in the nineteen seventies. For God's sake, he was writing for what mm. military modelling when his first fantasy facts column appeared, and then it became battle for war gamers, and then it was remerged back into military modelling, and then it was all kicked and it was practical war gamer and then he did some stuff in miniature war games and then you know the poor man's been pushed from pillar to post and bless his heart you know i i expected that he would be interviewed for the job partly because i put his name forward along with a certain other person on this podcast right now and <laughs> um the warners have made their choice and i can understand why they made the choice oh, and um, i think because apart from anything else they thought it would give it you know first of all there's continuity he's someone yeah. who's, he was 
in the process of working for the magazine. So effectively, people can look and say, oh, he's been promoted. <laughs> if you can call taking a poison chalice. I'm about to say, it's a bit of a poison chalice. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I, I mean, it is interesting the fact that, you know, because obviously one of the big questions uh, was the fact that, hang on, we're getting this new 16, uh, they get this new 16 page sci-fi and fantasy thing, uh, you know, uh, pull out or extra section. But what happens to the current sci-fi and fantasy, the uh, yeah, well, sci-fi and fantasy a, columnist? You that's know. a very, very good question. Uh, because one of my questions to Warners when this decision was announced to me was, so there's going to be this new fantasy sci-fi section in the middle of the magazine. I presume then that John Treadaway will be editing it. And of course the answer is no, he won't. Mm. Uh, it, it, in fact, it's going to be a mini magazine, all of its own in the middle, called Critical Hits. That's what they're calling it. And their intention, I, I, my understanding is, that they're intending to actually release it as a standalone 16-page digi magazine. So yeah, I... All I, all I can say is I hope you can build a picture that the instant that email arrived from Warners, a series of questions exploded into my head. <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> and none of which Warners were able to answer to my satisfaction. And therefore, I was left with no option. You know, with the primary thing being that this decision had been made without any consultation with me, that I was clearly going to have no input, no say on what this content was that was being put into my magazine. Because I, you know, the fact of the matter is, <laughs> as you know, you know, I'm highly active on social media and it's the editor's got to go out and face the punters. Warners mm. don't face the punters. It's me. And now, bless his heart, John. You know, who's fielding all those angry questions on TMP and the, the miniature war games Facebook page and, 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 uh, you know, and it's quite noticeable just in the, I think it's the last 24 hours, Warners have suddenly flooded the, their Facebook page with fresh content to shove the somewhat difficult discussions that have been going on there further down the page. <laughs> yes, I did, I did kind of notice that a I little mean, bit. you know, they do, of course, have the option of just deleting Strange, it. Strangely enough, not the only Wargaming-related Facebook group that's been having that issue. <laughs> there you go. Uh. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's basically a decision was made to create this kind of magazine within a magazine for reasons over which you know, that I had nothing to do with and over which I have absolutely no control. And it's at that point, because there's also this other thing, which is, and the phrase has been used to me repeatedly by staff at Warners, which is, Henry, you're just a freelancer. Right? Right. And you only have to hear that, you know, a couple of times before it really sinks in that, yeah, I'm not really part of the furniture, am I? Mm. I don't I don't work at head office. I'm not there when all these discussions are being had in their little meeting room there. Uh, they are just announced to me as a fait accompli. And I'm now 55 and I had a wish list of other things I've wanted to achieve in my life for a long, long time, which, you know, essentially... <laughs> I made the mistake of starting Battle Games 10 years ago and putting an awful lot of these things on hold for 10 years. Well, now I'm 55, and this stuff was happening with the magazine, and I just thought to myself, do you know what, Henry? Well, you've just got to go. Uh, yeah. Because if you're ever going to do these other things in your life, it's time to do it now. And things, things were not going to get any better for me. You know, what would I have done? How could I have looked at myself in the mirror carrying on as editor just for the money? And, of course, it makes it even more of a joke because what they actually pay you as a freelance editor is a complete joke. Mm. You know, mm. it, it, there's, there's a, there aren't many people who know what I've been being paid, uh, but I think there's a lot of people who, if they were to find out what I'm being paid, would go, you must be joking. Um, I, mate, that, you know, I, I was yeah, quipping yeah, with... Yeah, I think that was my comment, wasn't it? Uh, it could be, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So and, so and John as well, because John, John, when John got the deal with him, you know, he because he bless his heart, John actually rang me up and said, Henry, I feel really awkward about this, but I've actually been offered the job. You know, uh, if you say if you say no, I won't take it. I said, don't be stupid. 
I know that John's not in a happy financial position himself. He's, he was made redundant not too long ago. Uh, and and it would be a waste of his talents. And it, mm. there's a certain kind of justice, isn't there, that for all these years he's been a contributor to, to magazines and then finally gets the chance to actually, you know, have a say in the running of, you know, uh, uh, one of the market leaders. For goodness sake, you know, take the job. Take the job. You know, I'm I'm, I'm already gone. I'm past it. Uh, and it gives me comfort. And I, you know, said something similar to Neil. You know, give, give me comfort to know that... There is someone taking over the helm of the magazine who at least understands what I was trying to do with it. Mm. You know, yeah, because um, because yes, guys, just to clarify over something what I said, yes, John wasn't the only one who was interviewed for for the job. Uh, they interviewed me as well. Yeah, which was interesting because I yeah. got because I got a phone call the day after Henry resigned from, <laughs> from them saying, uh, "Can we get together and have a chat?" <laughs> I was like. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> yep. Mm. Yep. And, you know, I, I, well, I, I knew that obviously as the moment I handed in my notice, they were going to, because they're a big company, they don't f- around. They've got no, they're not sentimental in the slightest. No. I've had a couple of two line goodbye emails from them and that's it. <laughs> oh, right. uh, you yeah. know, it's, that's, that's the nature of the business. Magazine publishing is, Probably one of the most ruth- most ruthless industries on earth. Magazines come and go every day. Um, you only have to look at the shelves of W. H. Smiths, and you see that actually the number of magazines that appear on the shelves is really quite a select few of the many, many thousands that are actually produced. If you want to get on the shelves of W. H. Smiths, you have to pay them a bribe. Oh, sorry, no, I didn't mean that. Uh, what I meant was you have to pay them a inverted commas promotional fee close inverted commas just to appear on their shelves plus they take 55 percent of the cover price so you know this is why dear little old battle games could never you know when i was running it on my own could never appear on the shelves of w8 smith i'd have had to ask my bank for a loan i'd have to say oh look could you lend me uh yeah let me do some sums 30 grand um so i stand a chance of my magazine appearing on the shelves at w H. smith yeah i yeah. suppose the one good thing that's come out of this henry is with you starting gladius you've now got time to really go into it and you know push that as far as it'll go you, you built up a reputation in, in the in the hobby plus as you say you, you want to get into fiction writing so you know, like you said, the world the world is now your um, your lobster of of choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that, well, of course, we remember that's after that's after he's won the commune and the pig farm. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, and the trout farm as well. Yeah, be, yeah, because we saw the pictures, you know, of the beach. So I, 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 you know, I'm I'm assuming, Henry, you, you know, you've been off swimming and you've, uh, you know, and, and you started your Reggie Perrin bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was only. Do you know what? It was only after I'd posted that I thought, oh, I, oh, god, I think people might think something a bit different. I, I'd seen that photo. Was it going to walk into the sea? <laughs> I must admit, I did look at that picture and think, okay, what? Oh dear, oh dear. Oh, god, it wasn't beachy head. Otherwise, we would have been. <laughs> oh dear, dear, dear. Neil, yeah, yeah. Uh, Hen- Henry does a Lord Lucan. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, and then, trust me. It's uh, I have, now I've been given the idea. It's it's blooming tempting. I can tell you, but anyway, that the that I absolutely Mike, I've got a, a list of things to do as long as my arm. Plus, and this is you know one of the lovely things about having made some friends in the hobby over the years, in amongst the trade, is that you know I've had conversations with a number of people who, who've all said, "Oh, Henry, well if you're going to be doing this Gladius thing, would you?" publish this for me would you publish that for me and oh would you would you do this design for me and that design for me which is you know it's it's wonderful and hugely reassuring because obviously what i've done is i've effectively declared myself bankrupt overnight (laughs) i was was about to say how how are the sums coming out oh they're not my i don't do any sums i mean basically we are literally on a wing and a prayer here obviously you know well, there wouldn't have been any redundancy money anyway, because I'm not, I wasn't an employee of Warner's, you know, so they could, they couldn't sack me as such. I couldn't claim unfair dismissal or anything of that kind. You know, it's basically, I, I'm a freelancer and freelancer, your contract you know, with no 
written contract either, no proper contract. They don't do them in the magazine trade. So literally you walk out the door and that's that. You know, they'll, they'll pay my last invoice for having, you know, done the work I've just done on issue 402, but that's that. So, but fortunately I've already got, you know, I'm, I'm actually laying out Dave Brown's next rule set for, um, well, it's actually not Two Fat Lardies. It, uh, Rich and Nick at Two Fat Lardies are setting up a new sort Ooh, of... Oh, yeah, we week, saw that. Rice Fitz Press, mm. uh, which is basically because they, they'd they been approached by other people who said, oh, would you publish my rule set for me? And it's like, oh, I know what it's like, you know. I know how Rich feels. That's kind of like, oh, well, that's... You know, well, it's a good rule set, but it's not really a Two Fat Nardis rule set. So they've kind of created this extra brand for other people's rule set. And the first one they're doing is this new set of American Civil War rules for uh, Dave Brown called Pickett's Charge, which, in fact, he's been playtesting and stuff at the shows, hasn't he, in the last few shows. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'm actually doing the design and layout for that, and that's going to be ready, hopefully, to go to print touch wood next week. So I'm busy, busy, busy boy already, and I've hit the ground running. And in fact, it was getting irritating because I still had a load of paperwork to do for Warners, having finished, you know, the work work on the last issue of the magazine. And I was, I'd been hoping to really kind of go sprinting out of the blocks on, blocks on Monday morning, but it took me actually until Wednesday to finish, the, uh, yesterday to finish the paper, paperwork. So it's only been today's the first day. I can actually say I've been working on my other stuff. And as for the writing, well, my Phil Sidnell, my um, editor at Pen and Sword, rang me up and said, "Oh, so Henry, now that you you're not going to be editing the magazine, <laughs> I presume you're going to be writing lots of extra books for us." And I've had to say, and this is where the self discipline comes in. I've been had to say some uh, because this is a discussion we'll have some other time probably, and I've already had it with Neil, which is traditional publishing is not a route to take if you actually want to make a living. It's mm. a very good route to take if you want to have the kind of status of being published by a, a reputable publisher and, you know, you want a, a nice extra extra income on top of the one you already do. But if you actually want to be able to make a living as a writer, these days, make traditional publishing sucks. Unless you happen to be one of the very, very top... I, I, I was about to say, unless you happen to wind up on the New York Times bestseller list. Absolutely. Absolutely, and and but how many people does that actually happen to? We're talking about the top. one of my friends, surprisingly. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, um, Shauna Maguire, Myra Grant. If you've read any of her oh, modern right. urban fantasy novels, uh, I she's a friend of mine. Well, there you go. Well, that's wonderful. Well, she's one of the top ones, you know. And I do know some other people. Joanna Penn. There's a name that you'll have heard me say many times. She's been on the New York Times bestseller list, and she's a, but she's a self-published author. And this is the thing: I'm following the Joanna Penn route, uh, which basically means I've set myself up as an what's nowadays called an authorpreneur. So I'm going to be writing and publishing my own books, which is what it Gladys worked for Andy Weir. Yeah, and very well. Absolutely, and and uh, quite a number of others, and that's what I set up Gladius Publications for. It actually came as a surprise to me when duh, some other people who approached me said, "Oh, you set up a publishing company, Henry? Will you publish my stuff?" Because the thing is, as you can probably guess, it, all these people for ten years now, I've been publishing other people's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, so of course <laughs> it's going to take a while for people to change their mindset. You know, they so they're well, okay, Henry's. Henry's been publishing stuff for this magazine thing for 10 years now. Well, now he's not doing the magazine thing, but he set up this thing called Gladius Publications. Oh, so then he'll still publish my stuff. Well, the answer is maybe. Right. Uh, I, I it, but I, you know, I, I, I'm having to be really ruthless because otherwise I'm just going to spend the rest of my life publishing other people's stuff <laughs> with all the work that entails and not finishing my own mm. stuff. Hmm. which is my number one priority. I've got wargaming campaigns that I've got to finish by Christmas. I've got contracts for at least two more books, or is it three? I've lost count, with pen and sword. And he wants me to sign up for another two more, right? <laughs> and oh, I'm cool. saying... I'll take him off your hands. I'll think about it, I'm saying. But actually, what I want to do, I, I need to get cracking with my fiction career, big time. Because otherwise, I will just be getting more and more angry that I've been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. So there we go, mate. There we are. 
All right, so that's it's kind of the story, guys. All right, right. So it's going to be it's it, it's going to be the old um, thousand words before lunchtime then, every day. Two thousand. Two thousand before. Oh. Two thousand words a day. You you need to go and read Hunter Hunter S. Thompson's daily diary of schedule clearly. Uh, trust me, mate. I've read hundreds of books about daily <laughs> schedule. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so I think in one way, we, in one way, shape or form, this has been on your mind for a while, hasn't it? Yeah. Yes, Neil, yes. Uh, you because know, 'cause you've been one of the insiders on this, and mm. and obviously you've we've had a number of conversations where my how can we put this frustrations. <laughs> In front of the, that, that was the word I was, uh, 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 yeah, I was going to use. Uh, yes, yeah, so that is probably the most PC we can go as far as yeah. at this point. My, yes. my frustrations have been evident, and so obviously it's taken a huge intake of breath and mm. a, a very understanding other half. My dear Annie, bless her heart, has supported me you know, every step of the way. I mean, because she could see how depressed I was getting. You know, I was just getting more and more depressed that I was in a job that I felt like, you know, I should love this job. I should love this job. What's not to love about this job? I'm doing a job that's to do with my favorite hobby. What's not to like? Well, the trouble is it's the, you know, it's the way that I think this is the important aspect. Actually, it wasn't my hobby anymore. Mm. It had become what I did for a living. And that's one of the frustrations that the number of actual war games I was able to play in recent years had fallen to, you know, a handful a year if I was lucky. Uh, the amount of painting I'd been able to have time to do, well, I had these little fits and starts, didn't I? You know, I yeah. had nothing, for, nothing for ages, and then suddenly, you know, entire GHQ German World War One. <laughs> World War Two Army appears uh, <laughs> uh, in a, this kind of literal blitzkrieg, wasn't it? It was like almost overnight. I, could, was, I still look back and think, God, how did I do that? Um, but it was it was in these fits and starts, and there was no. What I'd realised was I'd kind of almost forgotten what I wanted to do with my own hobby, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, mm. I, you know, I was. My mate Guy would say, oh, that looks quite interesting. And so I'd charge off and do a bit for that. And then he'd change his mind. And, oh, let's have a go at this. And then he'd change his mind. It's like, really? No. This needs to be the other way around. I need to be saying, right, this is what I'm going to be doing. So, yes, I've, I <clears throat> essentially, I mean, literally just in the past few days, and I've been keeping a, a regular journal over recent weeks, I've noticed a, a lightening of my mood. And... The, this simultaneous feeling of excitement and sheer terror <laughs> 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 that I have a completely open horizon. I can do whatever I like. I am not beholden to anyone anymore, you know. And certainly in terms of this, this regular monthly treadmill, which is, you know, for someone who's not done that, it's very hard to describe just how it kind of almost suffocates you and i think you know because neil you and i had a chat on the last view from the veranda didn't we about how no, so. how how suffocating you can find it just writing a column well if you kind of multiply that up and having to get a, you know a 60 80 page whatever it is magazine to the presses on time particularly when uh, as has been evident in recent issues and you know, i've been filling quite a lot of it yeah all that says, yeah, good luck, John. I, I, bless his heart, I just hope he realizes what he's taken on. But there you are. It's now part of my history. Um, mm. and yeah, I, you know, it's, I'm, as I say, I'm really quite excited that the next time we chat about things, I'll be reporting on completely different stuff. And then, you know, there is this other, the, the sweet, the sweet note. Uh, I can't. I won't say too much at the moment, but let's just say you may see my name in print in other regular publications in the future. <laughs> <laughs> From which so, you may tell that various may have spoken to various other people about various things. <laughs> let's just say I've made a lot of friends over the years. Indeed. Uh, I, I, I just hope you have a nice um, illustrated um, article or two about miniatures that would be nice and sometimes i might talk about soldiers and strategy indeed um 
but you know, the, but not on the tabletop. We shall see. <laughs> exactly, not on the tabletop. So we shall see. But I've got a lot to look forward to, and you know, um, since this is going out live public fairly soon you know I, there are people out there with whom i've had conversations in the last few weeks they know who they are and i want to extend my huge heartfelt thanks to them for their support for their commiseration you know and obviously i'm including neil in this as well bless his heart he's been a sounding board support commiseration advice uh and sometimes just the fact that they've just sat there and listened to me while i babbled on like a maniac you know it, when when you're going through what you realize is going to be a major life change and it's all it, i think the thing is because obviously it's a, you know I, i've not been an accountant for a living this is something to which i've been incredibly emotionally attached for 10 years yeah it's been my baby and so handing it over lock stock and barrel for adoption and a name change uh is you know something that's not necessarily easy to swallow yes um, i can appreciate that mm. and so it's take i've had to find some inner resources that i didn't realize i had to be honest and i've had a few very dark days uh in recent months but now you know what it's like when you come out the other side of something you think god you know what was i worried about yeah uh, apart from the money <laughs> you know um which is obviously going to be interesting when the next mortgage payment comes around but other than that you know I've, I've compared to the situation I was in when battle games hit the buffers, for example. I mean, this is, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not at all in the same financial straits that I was in back then. I mean, that was really serious, you know, on, on the Richter scale of potentially bad things could happen. That was definitely a 9.9. .9, whereas this is, you know, kind of a three or a four, really. And, and there's all the excitement of, gosh, I'm now going to force myself to have the time to do all these things i've been promising myself i will do for years when um, you found some spare time yeah well i'm i'm, I'm just going to carve out spare time i'm going to set aside i'm working what i'm working out at the moment mike is actually what time of day do i write best um because up to now to fit my writing in i've been doing most of my writing late at night and by late at night, I mean usually starting after midnight. Oh, you, oh, are got... you are turning into Hunter S. Thompson, then. Yes. <laughs> um, 12.05 to 6 a.m. Hunter yeah. S. Thompson is ready to write. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and a number of other famous... Dean Wesley Smith, there's another one who writes at peculiar hours. Yeah, so I'm at the moment, I'm, you know, I've always made the assumption up to now that, oh, yes, that's, you know, I'm a night owl, that's what I do. Well, now I've got the choice, I, and I'm going to experiment with... Well, uh, perhaps I should get up really early in the morning and write for a couple of hours, or maybe later in the morning, or lunchtime, or in the afternoon, or you know, whatever. So this is quite exciting. I mean, it's literally I'm going to be experimenting with myself because we all go through natural body cycles, don't we? And there's no point, you know, fighting it. If I, if it turns out, do you know what? I am at my best between you know one and four in the morning. Well, so be it. But yeah, so what I'm doing, I'm going to be setting aside a chunk of time every single day where basically the phone comes off the hook. I switch off all the devices. I disconnect from the internet. I am completely incommunicado because that is my writing time. And I cannot afford, literally cannot afford for anything to interfere with that. Hmm. Um, and then the rest of the time, you know, because, the, you know, it's the writing that demands the most concentration. I mean, most, you know, most design and layout stuff by now, I've been doing it for 20 odd years, nearly 30 years. It's, you know, it doesn't require a huge amount of thought process other than the initial kind of design concept stage. But beyond that, usually you're kind of working to a template of something you've done before so you can crank it out fairly quickly. But, um, yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing, guys. And I'm looking at the clock, and I'm going to have to call it a day here, my friends. Well, that stops us doing it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dang, we had a question about point systems as well. <laughs> we'll come back to that on you. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Uh, well, Henry, first off, can I just say thank you for your candour and um, 
thank you for talking to us. Uh, in what has been, I think it's safe to say, quite a difficult time in a lot of ways, isn't it, mate? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So appreciate you coming on and and, uh, and giving us your side, side of the events. Thank you for 10 years of a couple of really good gaming magazines. Thank you. Um, and everything that you put into it. I know you put your heart and soul into it. And and yeah, thank you for thank you for what you've done, and um, yeah, 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 you know, really, all the very best for what's to come. I'm nervous for you, just seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Neil, you're not a high risk taker like I am. I think um, it's in my blood. You, you, it's the I, I, I'm prepared to do the kind of things that, let's be honest, most other people quite sensibly, aren't prepared to do. Hmm. Um, I think a long time ago I decided that I wasn't going to fit into any particular mould. And, you know, I've, I've run other businesses and taken, you know, made a lot of major changes in my life over the time. And, I'm, you know, in a sense I'm lucky because I haven't got kids to worry about. You know, the cats will be fine. So I've not got to worry about, oh, God, I can't do that. I'm trapped because I've got a family to feed and all that kind of stuff, yeah, which is the reality, let's face it, for 99.9% of people. Mm-hmm. And um, so in a sense, whilst, you know, I, I, as like anyone who hasn't got kids, I suppose I have occasionally a pang of regret that I don't have kids, but that's just the way life's turned out. But the upside of that is it means that I can quite literally afford to take much more uh, what to other people would probably be uh, stupid risks <laughs> um, and and live with the consequences. You know, that's the thing. This might all go badly wrong. And I, in, in six months or a year's time, I might be desperately looking for a job. And, you know, already at the age of 55, I'll probably, you know, I might be thinking, oh, God, I wish I hadn't done that. Um, because obviously the older you get, it doesn't get any easier to get a decent job, does it? No. But um, I have a feeling that I'm going to succeed. It, I very much doubt it's going to be overnight because I know, you know, I've been in business a long time and I know that these things take time. Uh, and getting all the right systems in place and getting the right team around you of people who, you know, who can help you with different things and will, will help you for the right price, you know, these are all this is all stuff that takes time but i'm ext- i count myself very fortunate that i've got some good friends who are very supportive and uh who when you know because i i've got those friends when i go to do something i know that probably many more people will get to hear about it far sooner than would be the case for a lot of other people and for that i shall always be grateful um, and obviously it's that, if you like, that sense of friendship and community that has made it all worthwhile. Because even though I walk away kind of leaving my baby behind, as it were, what I take with me is, you know, a, a huge amount of goodwill. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful for that. Well, once again, Henry, thank you for, thank you for coming on and talking to us. And hopefully we'll get a chance to chat together pretty soon. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. Take Boy, care. Yes. Cheers, Henry. Take care. Cheers. Cheers, Henry. Take care. Bye. Well, there you have it. Thank you once again to Henry Hyde for being willing to be interviewed and for his answers to our question. As we mentioned during the interview, Warner's approached me regarding the editorial job at Miniature War Games. Uh, by the sound of things, I'd had a, a very similar conversation with Henry uh, that John ended up, John Treadaway ended up having uh, about you know, whether Henry would be happy if I pursued that. And actually, you know, whether I should pursue it, whether that was something I, you know, I should do or at least should consider. And in that, you know, Henry was was more than supportive. So, you know, I want to go on record and say thank you to Henry for that. As it turned out, uh, I was unsuccessful. 
And, you know, they'd given the role to John. You know, I think knowing that John was probably you know, the major candidate I was up against, I'm not surprised with their decision. I think I'd have gone with John as well. You know, he has far more experience in publishing than I do. And so, yeah, we'd like to uh, like to wish him well with the position that he's now got. And it will be interesting to see where the magazine goes from here. You know, those of you on social media and on you know, a couple of the news sites will know that uh, the first few days of John's tenureship at, uh, as editor has met with a mixed response, which is kind of what you'd expect, I suppose, in any, you know, in any change of, uh, of something like this. Now, some people may be wondering, you know, does that now change uh, my position with the magazine at all? Well, to be honest, not really. I've already spoken to John, and I'll be continuing in my current role as a, a reviewer on the magazine. And anything else? Well, and as for anything else, well, I'll be submitting any potential articles uh, in the same way as any other contributor would. But, I won't be coming back to writing a column with Miniature Wargames anytime soon. Um, I think, as you may have guessed on the last uh, episode of View from the Veranda, uh, you know I've got some different ideas for what I want to do with my time at this point in, uh, at the moment. One of which is to grow what we're doing here at Meeples and Miniatures. But more of that in the future. So that's all we've really got time for uh, on this special episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. All that remains to be said is thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you found the show interesting. And uh, the next show will be coming up in very short order, all being well in the next few days. And as we said, uh, we'll have a, a, an in-depth chat with Sam Mustafa. And so until then, uh, happy gaming, and we'll chat to you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, why not share it with others by leaving us a review on iTunes? And if you have any comments or questions, you can always email the show. The address is info at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk And you can also visit our webpage, where you'll find a complete episode archive, all the View from the Veranda podcasts, rules reviews, and our blog of hobby items and news, which is updated several times a week. This is also where you'll find the links to our presence on social media. And here you can follow us on Twitter or join our Facebook group. And finally, here you can also find details should you wish to support us by making a donation to the podcast. All this on the Meeples and Miniatures website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.